In this video, I'm going to show you how to write a Docker file in a multi-stage structure, which will help us build separate Docker images for local development as well as the deployable image that we then deploy to other environments like production. One quick announcement before we start. If you're interested in getting started with Kubernetes on AWS and learn to create Kubernetes cluster on AWS EKS and deploy microservices or different kind of applications, please check out this Kubernetes course. I leave a link in the description for your reference. Back to the episode of learning multi-stage Docker build. I am going to use an application that we Dockerize first, meaning that we create a Docker file to run locally in development and update the Docker file to use multi-stage structure to be able to build a deployable image. Here is the application code, a web application written in Ruby on Rails. If you are not familiar with Rails, that is totally okay, as the application structure is not much different than the structure of applications written in other frameworks. And we are not going to be looking into the source code of this application, but rather focus on the Docker and multi-stage part in the Docker file. It is a simple blog application which requires a MySQL database, an easiest one I could think of for the purpose of this course. Let me get the code to my local first and cd into that code directory, example Rails app, and I'll open that up in a code editor. Let's take a quick look at some of the basics of this application code structure, starting with the app directory, which is where most of the application code goes. Things like controllers, views, services goes in here. You're not going to make any changes to this folder, so let's not touch it. The gem file is where we define all the gem dependencies. I'm going to clean this up a little bit to make it more readable. Here it is. And these are the libraries or gems in Ruby that this application needs. You may be familiar with a similar concept in other frameworks such as package JSON in Node applications. Now there are a couple of things to note in this file. Besides the source of these gems and the Ruby version, it, it mentions all the gems and their versions that this application depends on. And there are some group specific gems. These are gems that we need only for develop or only for test or maybe both develop and test. And we don't need them in production or in the deployable image that we finally built. And the last file that we will update in this code is the database YAML, which is where the database configs will go. That'll be an easy one to update. We'll update that in a little bit. That's all the details that you need to know about this application structure. Now let's go ahead and add a simple Docker file, not a multi-stage one yet. I'm going to assume that you know some basics of Docker and you're here to learn about multi-stage in particular. With that assumption, I'll try to keep this part really short. I'm going to paste in some code here. The base image for this application is Ruby 3.1.2 from Docker Hub. That was the version of the Ruby we needed, as we mentioned in the gem file. Next, it creates a work directory for the application that runs inside the container, which is going to be slash app, and then install some build tools. Depending on the application's build requirements, this step may involve installing a few or many build tools that you'll need during the build or development stage. I just needed to install build essentials package for this application and copy the gem file and the gem file lock. If you're not a Ruby developer, you may be familiar with lock files such as package lock JSON or yarn lock, etc. So it's a very similar concept. The next thing it runs is a bundle install command. So this command goes over the gem file and installs all the gems and their dependencies. And the last one in the Docker file is the command, the command to run when the container starts up. In this case, it runs a Rails server. Now that's all for the Docker file for now. We are going to come back to this and make some more changes later when we get to the multi-stage part. Now let's go to the database YAML and make some quick changes. This is the default database YAML that got generated when the Rails application was created. I'm going to update this to read the database configuration from environment variables. That will make running it inside the container a little bit easy for us. Now that we have the Docker file ready, let's build the Docker image. At this point, we did not really need the database YAML updated, but we will need that soon after we build the image. And the command is docker build with the tag blog app dev. Now this is going to be image name or repository name, whatever you call it, and give the build context. It's going to be the current directory where the Docker file is. This will take some time. Basically it does the following. It downloads the base Ruby image from Docker Hub, creates the work directory, installs some build tools, copies the gem file and the log files from the host to container image, 
and runs the bundle install command that installs all the gems and their dependencies. We have the Docker build complete and the image has been built. I can now run the application as docker container using docker command but instead I'm going to write a docker compose file which will make it a little bit easier running containers on local development. Let me copy paste some code into the docker compose file real quick. Here we have two services. One is for the app. I name it as blog app and the second one is the database service for MySQL and the name of that service is going to be blog DB. Let's take a quick look at the service definition here. The blog app service. The first few lines of this service is for building the Docker image. The next is the volume. When we run the application in development, the container should have the access to the application code. Here we do that by mounting the current directory to app, the work directory inside the container. The environment section here is where we supply the database configurations as environment variables, as read in the database YAML file. The blog app service depends on the MySQL database service, the blog DB, defined below. If you notice the database configuration here, the values of DB name or password match the values supplied to the blog app. And the database host here is the service name of the MySQL container service, which is going to be blog DB. And that makes it easy to link the services within the Docker Compose. The last one is the port. The Rails by default listens on port 3000. And here we want to map the container port 3000 to a different port or the same port on the host depending on what's available. So in my case, I don't have port 3000 available on my Mac. So I'm going to use 3101 so that I can access the application as localhost 3101 on my browser. Now that's all for the Docker Compose. Let's go ahead and build the Docker image again using the Docker Compose this time. So the command is docker compose build. Build is now complete. Let's now run the app. The command is docker compose up. As the blog service depends on blog DB service, the DB service will be triggered first to start and then the blog app container will start up. The Rails app has started up. It is listening at port 3000 inside the container and we should be able to hit that at localhost 3101 from the browser. Before we do that, let's take a quick look at the container status. The command is docker compose ps. Both the services blog app and the blog db are running. One more thing is that the database was started up. We haven't really created anything in that. So the database should be empty at this point. So we'll have to create some tables and insert some data so that we can test the website by hitting localhost 3101. The command to create or modify the database schema in Rails is Rails db migrate. And we can run that inside the running container of blog app or we can spin up a new container as well. So I'm going to run it inside the container which is already running. So the command is docker compose exec, the container service that's already running, the blog app and the command to run inside that container that will be rails db migrate. The command ran successfully and created necessary tables. We don't have to look into the database and check those. Now let me run one more command inside the container to load some test data. In rails, generally, the seed start rb is where the script to seed development data goes. This is a simple script here. This script basically creates about 20 blog post entries with some random fake content. Not a perfect code to seed the data in Rails, but works for now. The command is docker compose exec, the running container of the service blog app, and the command to run inside that container, Rails db seed. That is complete, and there should be some test data for us to browse now. Let's hit the web app on localhost 3101 and it works. Here it lists blog post entries that we just loaded using Rails DB seed. Site seems functional. Let's navigate between the admin and the user facing part of the website. All looks good. So that is our Docker setup for the local development environment. Now let's stop all the containers and go over the details of why we need to approach multi-stage Docker build. Can we use the image that we built for local as the production image that we deploy to any of the environments or mainly production? Possibly with some changes, but that may not be a good idea. There are a few reasons why you don't want to use that image deployed to any environments other than your local development. Firstly, the image built using Docker file does not include the application code. That is particularly for the Rails application here. And that will require us to update the Docker file to copy the application code to the work directory. And if we did that, the Docker build will always copy the app code even if you're building for the local development, which is unnecessary. 
Another major problem is the size and also the security aspect. Now, this is primarily the reason why we go about multi-stage build. The image we use in development or the base image we use in development or the final build out of the image that we use in development is generally bigger than what you would really use in production. That is because we need certain build tools, OS packages, etc. during the development and build time. So image will contain the build tools, OS dependencies, which we don't need in production. And more importantly, to reduce the security risk, we shouldn't even include them in the image that we build for production. And one more thing here is the bundler. You may have a similar things in other frameworks as well that installs all the dependencies, all the libraries, including the ones that are specific to development and or test environments. We don't want to ship the dependencies of development to other environments definitely not production. And there may be a few other configurations that may differ between your development and production environments that also needs to be kept separate. You will see a similar pattern of Docker file requirements regardless of the programming language and the framework the application is built on. Now let's see how we can transform this Docker file into a multi-stage format or structure and see how that helps in building images for both development and production. There may be two or more stages depending on the application's build requirements. And for this application, I will need about four stages. I'm going to start by outlining the four stages first. And stage one is going to be the builder or the base in which we will install all the build time tools or any basic requirements that we primarily use during development and the build. Now stage two will be the target stage for the development environment. This is specifically for the local environments, meaning that in here, the stage one and stage two together should cover everything that you need to build and run the application in your local development. And the stage three will be an intermediate stage where we run commands to build the artifacts or anything for production. I will name this as prod build. Now this is gonna differ from what we do for in development. So it does a little bit more than what the build will do for, for the local. And that is why it is an intermediate stage. I name it as prod build. And stage four will be the one that we finally build as a deployable image that we ship to any of the environments and that you should be able to run it on your local as well. Let's start with stage one. I'm gonna delete all the commented code here and start with stage one. This stage will be similar to what we had in the Docker file before, except that there is no startup command for the application. Everything included in this stage will become the base for building or packaging the application whether you need it for the local development or in your CI. This stage will be the base. Let's do a quick walkthrough. This stage is basing off of the Ruby image from Docker Hub, creates a work directory, installs necessary build tools that don't come with the base image, copies gem file and gem file lock, and installs all the gems or packages and their dependencies. Let's continue and finish up the develop stage, the second stage, and run the application. Now this stage will be based off of the builder stage instead of the Ruby image from Docker Hub. That means this stage will inherit all the layers created in the builder stage. Name of the stage is develop. For now, the only thing we need in the stage is the application startup command, which was in the Docker file before. And that should be it for the develop stage. Now with that, I'm gonna build the Docker image one more time and try to run the application. Now before we build, we need to make one small change in the Docker Compose file under the build section of the blog app service. Next to the build context, add a build target stage. When we use the multi-stage Docker file, we have to provide the stage name as the build target. Not providing the build target will still work, but might end up building the image for the wrong stage. That may not be relevant for your development. So the target stage will be developed. Let's go ahead and build again, Docker Compose build. A little bit fast forward, the build is complete. Let's start up the containers again using Docker Compose up and the app container is running, listening at port 3000. Let's hit the web app again on localhost 3101 and it still works just fine. So far, we don't really see any major advantages of using multi-stage Docker build. The result of building an image or running the app with or without the multi-stage was the same. Let's stop the services and go back to the Docker file again to write the other two stages to really understand the benefit of using multi-stage. The third stage is gonna be an intermediate stage where we build for production. This stage will also base off of the builder stage as we need the build tools to run things like bundle install, 
In other frameworks, things like compilers or any other tools that you need to package the application to build some artifacts. Let's name this stage as prod build. The first thing in the stage will be the application code. In Rails or Ruby in general, we ship the application code itself and not in any compiled format. Here we copy the app code to container image. This copy command copies everything from the app directory or the current code directory to the working directory inside the container image, which will be forward slash app. You may not want to copy everything. Things like files from logs or temp directories, etc. We don't want them to be copied to the Docker image that we build for production. To do that, we can add in a Docker ignore file in which we can list all the files or folders that we expect the Docker build to ignore. The syntax is very similar to the kid ignore file, so it should be familiar. Now let me copy some more code to the stage. The first one here is the command that builds the front-end assets. If you're not a Rails developer, you probably know similar things in other frameworks as well. Essentially, this step runs things like CSS preprocessors, minification, etc. and build the final front-end assets such as the CSS, JS bundles, and images, and so on. And the next two lines is where I configure the bundler to skip the gems and dependencies that were specifically for develop and test group. And then also mention the path to install all the gems and dependencies for production. And with that, when we run bundle install as the next step in this stage, it'll only install the gems and dependencies necessary for prod and exclude everything that is for development and test groups. And all those gems and dependencies will go under the folder slash Ruby gems. Now that's all for the stage three, the prod build. As the name indicates, prod build has some build time tools, which we don't want to be included in the final deployable image, which takes us to stage four, the prod stage. Unlike other two stages, develop and prod build, this stage will not be basing off of the builder stage. And that is because we don't want to ship anything that is build time dependencies or build time libraries installed in the image that we deploy. The more importantly, this image will be built off of a Ruby image, the same version as the one used in the builder stage, but built with minimal requirements. I'm going to use the Ruby 312 hyphen slim from Docker Hub. If you compare the size of these two images, they'll be very different. In sizes, obviously the 312 slim will be smaller, but both the images are built on the same OS, which is more important. So I'm going to copy some more code to the stage and here it is. Let's do a quick walkthrough. We have to create the work directory again as we are using the fresh image, which doesn't have the required work directory for our application. Next, three commands are to copy stuff from the prod build stage. Now this makes all the difference now and you really notice the advantage. The first copy command here is the one that copy the app directory from the prod build stage to the app directory of the stage or the one that's gonna build as a deployable image. And then we copy the Ruby gems, which was built in the prod build stage, gets copied to the same directory in the deployable image. And copy any other native dependencies, like .so files, or anything else that you need from the prod build stage into the prod stage, or the image that's gonna be built out of prod stage. So this particular one we need is for the MySQL gem that the application uses for the database connections. Similar to the prod build stage, let's configure the bundler to ignore development and test groups, and that is to make it not look for any of those dependencies that are not relevant for production. And also point the gem location to slash Ruby gems, and that's where we have the Ruby gems, all the dependencies copied to. Lastly, the container or the application startup command, which will be the same as that of the develop in this case. So that's all about stage four, the prod stage, and I hope that makes more sense now. Now let's build the image for prod stage or the deployable image. Unlike the development image that we built using Docker Compose, we will use plain Docker command to build the deployable image. And the command is docker build, the tag, I'll name it as blog app dash prod, and the target stage to build from the Docker file, the stage will be prod, and give it the directory of the application code containing the Docker file, which will be the current directory, dot. And let's run it. This will take some time depending on what gets installed, how much time it will take to completely build it for production. Fast forward a little bit, the build is complete and it built the deployable image. Now let's list both the blog app images and compare the sizes. 
the one that was built for develop using Docker Compose and the one that we just built for production. And the command is Docker images. I'm going to filter by the name reference and format the output to display only the image name and the size of the image. Here we have the two images. The size of the blog app prod image is about 300 megs, whereas the size of the blog app dev image is over a gig. And so that explains how multi-stage made a difference. And that's why you don't want to deploy your development stage image to production. Now that we have the deployable image that can be deployed to any other environments, including prod, we should be able to run it on local as well. So I'm going to be using Docker Compose to run and test this Docker image locally. So in the Docker Compose YAML, let's copy the blog app service and make another service. I'm going to name it as blog app prod. And this is to demonstrate how you can run or test the deployable image in your local setup. There will be a few differences between this service blog app prod and the blog app in this Docker Compose service definitions. First is that the blog app prod will not build any image. So let's remove the build section from the service. And instead, the blog app prod will use the prod image we just built. Let's mention that here. And the prod image already has the app code copied to its work directory. So we can remove the volume from here. We don't have to volume mount the code directory. And I want to use the same database as used by the blog app, the development one. The next is the port. The rails inside the prod container will listen on port 3000 in the container. As 3101 is already taken for the development service, I'll change this to 3102. The environment variables for the database configuration will remain the same for the most part. I'll just add a few more variables here to make the application run in production mode. The main one here is Rails environment, Rails env, that indicates that the application inside the container, the Rails, will run in production mode. And that's all for this service to test running our application in production mode using the deployable image that we shipped to production. Now let's run that service. Docker Compose up. I'm going to mention the name of the service here, blog app prod. That means we don't want the other service blog app be running. It will still run blog db because blog app prod depends on that service. The prod container is running and the app is listening at port 3000, which should be available on localhost 3102 on our host. Let's hit the app on browser, localhost 3102, and it works. That is fully functional. Application inside the container is running in the production mode. Before we wrap up, a quick announcement, as I mentioned at the beginning of this video. If you're interested in learning Kubernetes on AWS, I have a course which will help you learn creating Kubernetes cluster on AWS EKS using Terraform as the infrastructure coding tool. And you'll also learn deploying a project that consists of multiple microservices to Kubernetes cluster. So please check that course and share with your friends or colleagues who may be interested in this topic. And I'll mention the course link in the description for your reference. Coming back to the multi-stage build, a couple of tips and notes for you. Firstly, this multi-stage build does not explain all of the security related concerns. There may be more involved in building image for the production in your environment. To improve the efficiency of the build process, you may tweak a few commands between the stages or write it in another way. But the overall concept of using stages will still remain the same. There may be some syntax differences as well. And lastly, this Docker file is not perfect, even for Rails application, but it gives an idea of how you can approach multi-stage structure for your Docker build. Depending on your build and security requirements, your production or prod build stage may differ in some of the configurations and scripts. That's all for the multi-stage Docker build. I hope you find it helpful. Thanks for watching.